we are discussing quantitative research, and these are slides that are in your course room, but I wanted to highlight a few things to look for as you work to understand how quantitative research fits into um, your um, entrepreneurial marketing program. So when we look at quantitative or what we call descriptive research, there are questions, a lot of questions, but you want to make sure that you're asking questions that will yield answers that you could actually put to work actionably for you or your client or the company, right? Um, descriptive research is sometimes observation, usually asking questions, most often online. Online surveys have changed the whole realm of quantitative research. So, um, you will have a larger sample size, generally 100 or more, and they should usually be randomly sampled so that you can then generalize or project findings to a larger population. So if 15% of respondents say yes in your survey of 100, that could be 12 to 18% in your target market, depending on what your universe was. So if you were doing Houstonians, then it would be 12 to 18% of Houstonians, for example. Quantitative research is great because it happens very quickly. You structure your questions, you program them in because they're usually online. You put them on a platform like Qualtrics or SurveyMonkey or Alchema or any of the others. You secure your sample, which usually comes from a panel, and you tell it go, and they gather data in one, two, three, five, eight days, and you're done. Then you analyze it. Works pretty well. Some of the challenges, though, are, of course, depending on who you're interviewing, it may be hard to reach them. Uh, low response rates are less a problem now than before because we're not asking people to answer the phone. They can respond if they want to, if they're part of a panel. They will get points. That's how they're paid. They gather their points. They buy stuff. You know, so that works out pretty well. Or they may have an interest like, you know, members of Country Club or something like that. They would be willing to participate because they have an invested, a vested interest or an investment in that Country Club and they, they want it to work the way they think it should. So they will give you their opinion gladly without payment, right? So those are called self-administered surveys. I think that's kind of an old-fashioned term. We just call them online surveys. I'm just telling you. So, <clears throat> And online service surveys, yes, there's propensity scoring that can adjust the results. We don't use it very often. You can oversample and undersample. So if you want to have, um, let's say you're doing a study on healthcare product and men and women both buy it and you want to interview both men and women, and you know you want 50-50 male, female, and I could tell you if it's healthcare, 80% of your respondents are going to be female. Men are like, eh, and they just don't respond the same. So you might have to oversample or you might have to push that number, right? Um, oversampling can be if I want to look at, let's say a group of 20 to 25 year olds who are enrolled in university, within this sample, that's not going to come up very often. So I would over sample that group so that I have enough to analyze them by themselves. I might want to interview 60 or 70 of them, because if I have 12 of them, that's not really enough. I can't analyze the results of 12 responses and say, well, 50% of them said this. So I would want to oversample them. So there are a lot of different things that happen. Um, with the advantages, when they talk about randomizing the question order, this is to avoid respondent fatigue. So if I have a series of questions I want to ask, so for each of the following, please rate it on a scale of one to five, or one means you agree complete, disagree completely, and five means you agree completely. And the first one is, I don't know, doctors were accessible, uh, nurses were courteous, there was plenty of parking, you know, it goes on, you get five, 10, 20 questions. And if you ask the doctor question first every time, and the nurse question last every time, the nurse question is actually going to get poorer scores. So what you do is you can 
click a button on online research to randomize the question order. So you might be asked the doctor question first. I might be asked the nurse question first. Somebody else might be asked the parking question first. So that removes a question order bias, which is a result of what we call respondent exhaustion. Because by the time you're at the end of a longer survey, you're just like, oh, please, just in here. Yeah, 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 right? You're not paying as much attention. They're not reading it as clearly. Uh, as carefully. So this is one way to um, address that. Um, sampling is of a science unto itself. So sampling means that you're not going to interview every Houstonian who has health care needs. You're not going to interview, you're going to interview a percentage of them. You're actually going to interview a sample that's large enough to reduce your rate of error. You do not have to go into those details in this course. But normally, if you interview 100 randomly selected persons uh, in a universe or a large population, that's at least 10,000, which is considered infinity sized, infinitely sized. Um, the rate of error is about 9.8%. If the answers were 50% yes, 50% no, that means it could go 40% yes, no, or it could go 40% no, yes. So usually we do almost 300 as a minimum. You don't have to do that as much anymore. And with academic research, we usually limit it to 100. So uh, just it's just a rule of thumb. It's it, you, you actually calculate it using uh, some of the sampling calculators, but <clears throat> you're going to interview or include a randomly selected sample that is screened to be your population. They must be users of the product or they're between these ages or they're in college or whatever it is. They own a car, they buy fuel from Shell, whatever it is, right? Okay, so this is the population, which is, and this is a great example, right? Adult purchases or purchasers of automobiles. And uh, the sampling would be new Mazda purchases between these dates. So it's just more finite, that's all. Um, your sampling frame is basically where you're gonna get them. And sometimes the sampling frame, like a panel, an online panel reduces the size. In other words, so you're only interviewed people who were signed up on a panel. Now, most of America is signed up on a panel somewhere. so. Um, it, there's less bias in that than there used to be, but be aware of it. Um, so we have probability sampling, which is what we use for quantitative and non-probability sampling, which comes from convenient sampling, like if you're interviewing people at a conference or on the street. Um, we prefer probability sampling in that each person has an equal um, likelihood or propensity to be selected. Non-probability sampling means, well, it's only people who went to the conference, right? So it's not as generalizable. It would be hard to take a non-probability sample and make statements like 50% of people or 13% of people like the product. No, 15% or 13% of people at that conference who were willing to be interviewed on the floor of the exhibit hall like that product. That's all you can say. You can't say more. Simple random sampling is when everybody has an equal chance of being selected. Systematic random sampling is a little bit different. Uh, you can read the breakdown later. It's in your, your uh, uh, PowerPoints. And then stratified random sampling is when you're looking for, we want a sample of men who have purchased this kind of car. We want a sample of teens whose parents bought them a car. And you know, so you have, these groups and you're controlling the size of the number of persons in that group. So it doesn't necessarily look like your entire target market, but segments of your target market. And cluster sampling is very similar to that. Convenient sampling, not so much. So you do want to look at how to determine an appropriate sampling design. So are you, are you uh, having to do this quickly? Where is it being done? Um, is it Houston? Is it a conference? Is it on campus? Is it a national study, right? So all of these are things to consider. Um, fortunately, um, for this course, you won't have to go too stringent 
you'll be able to do what you think is appropriate. So you define your sampling plan, then you gather your data, you write your questionnaire, and you have to have good questions, okay? And then you might even pre-test or what we call a slow release. You won't have to do a pilot study. A slow release for online. That's where you do just a few, and then you look at the results you're getting to see if your questions are ambiguous, if they're able to answer the questions. If you had a lot of don't knows, that might mean you have to rewrite some of the questions, right? All right, so let's look. So you want to collect your data properly, and then you want to develop questions. So let's look at that. So when you develop questions, here's the deal. You start general, and you get it's just like qualitative. You get narrower and more specific and more logical, more linear as you move through it. So you, if you want to understand their unprompted recall of a brand, or you want to ask them, so when you want tacos, where do you go? Where's the first place you think of? And they might give you two or three names of the places they think of. That should be a question that's asked very early in the survey. Now, if you tested three taco companies, three taco restaurants, and then said, when you think of tacos, which restaurants do you think of? Which ones do you think they're going to talk about? The three you just tested. So that would not make sense. So we need to make sure that the questions are in an appropriate order. So unprompted recall questions, then prompted recall. Then you start evaluating the brands. You ask about usage. Then you ask them to evaluate. Sometimes you can do usage after. And then if you are asking questions about problems or issues, you might want to put those later. Or if you want to ask them about a particular brand. So let's talk about Taco Bell specifically, because maybe your client's Taco Bell. Let's talk about Taco Bell specifically. So when you think of Taco Bell, what one word comes to mind? So um, what does Taco Bell do that nobody else does? That would be an open-ended quant question. Um, how likely are you to visit Taco Bell if you get hungry after 11 at night? Um, have you ever visited Taco Bell? Maybe they didn't volunteer Taco Bell earlier, but you can ask them specifically now because you've told them, we're going to talk about Taco Bell. Now, they don't know if your Taco Bell is your client. You might say, um, I need to ask you about a restaurant. Let me see which one. Okay, let's talk about Taco Bell. And they might think, well, they've got three or four companies they're asking about. But that's what you hold at the end. And often there's even negative questions. Have you seen or heard um, um, what uh, any um, um, stories or reports about lawsuits associated with Taco Bell? And by the way, I don't know of any. I'm just using that as an example. You would want to ask that at the very end, kind of right before you ask them about perhaps their media usage. So this is how you push those sensitive questions to the end. Then you want to decide how you're going to present this. And usually it's just online, right? There are different ways of putting the questions, but do it online. Make it simple and make sure that you structure it so that it works on mobile, because most people are doing their surveys on mobile now or a tablet <clears throat> and not on a computer. And then you actually want to do a slow release uh, a pretest, perhaps after you've looked at it. I always test it myself. I go through the survey myself as a respondent and see what makes sense and what sounds stupid. There's always a question that sounds stupid. When you do it yourself, you're like, I can't believe I wrote that question. Um, these are some of the things I would encourage you. Um, this is in your book and it's also in your PowerPoint. These are all elements to kind of check off before you complete a study. And by the way, I just want to mention something about measurement scales. You can do more research in your uh, uh, on these in your book. There is nothing more irritating or biased than a scale that says which of the following best describes how you feel about your purchase. It was, you know, uh, excellent, the best it could be, really good. It worked out really well. Um, fairly successful. I'm I'm using, you know weird words here, um, not too bad, or I wasn't happy. So there's no balance to that at all. And not too bad for you and not too bad for your best friend might be two different things. One might be you needed it, so it wasn't too bad. You were so happy to have it. 
your friend might have bought it on a whim and feels like it was a waste of money. So using scales that are measurable and that are balanced. So if you're doing a five point Likert type scale or a seven point scale, you want to have, you know, extremely satisfied, somewhat satisfied, neither satisfied nor unsatisfied, somewhat unsatisfied and ex I'm dissatisfied and extremely dissatisfied. So there's a balance around that middle point. Anyhow, because when you have like four answers that are positive and one that's negative, it's like, is this a sales piece or are we actually doing a survey? So just keep in mind that your respondent sees these things and it changes how they perceive the value of completing the survey. Um, also, when you're talking about personal opinions, be careful not to ask a question that, if answered honestly, would frame the respondent in the light of having made a foolish decision. Um, these are biased questions, and you're probably pretty capable of, of moving around this, but they might be along the lines of, um, to what extent do you agree or disagree with the following statement? I really feel like I made a mistake in buying my car. How many people are going to say, yeah, I'm stupid? You know, they're not going to say that. So you have to word it in a way that allows them to be critical of a product without self-identifying as being um, making a foolish decision. So, you know, I would say the, you know, how, how likely, I'm sorry, your level of agreement or disagreement with the following, the car did not meet my expectations. The, um, the um, turning radius is definitely not as good as other, or is not uh, as good as other vehicles I have been in or driven, something like that. Instead of saying, I made a mistake and I really would go backwards and undo it if I could, <laughs> right? We've all been there, but we don't like to confess that we made a, a, a foolish mistake. All right. Um, Pre-test is when you're doing like a national study with thousands. We usually do, uh, I mean, uh, a pilot study is when you're doing thousands. A pre-test is just when you want to make sure that your questions make sense and you're able to get answers that actually will help you. Um, sometimes you could ask an open-ended question at the end of the study or even a closed in, you know, uh, how would you describe your experience completing this questionnaire? What would you change? What was difficult? Something like that. It's okay to add that to that pretest and then remove it for the actual survey. Then you implement the survey and collect the data and then you analyze the data. And that, of course, is the fun part. I hope this has been helpful for you and um, share your questions with your instructor.